This looks like some sort of protest, doesn't it? There's a few that escaped, wasn't there? Henry VIII. Yeah. 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 I, should, I would guess that it was rich enough to be able to backhand Henry VIII yeah. and say, look, yeah. the source of income here for you, don't burn it down. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah, this is it. See, this is where it gets difficult now because I need to be doing this one and doing my normal videoing, and I can't. And if I asked you to do any of the videoing, you're going to go not on your Nelly. I forgot knows how many years and didn't you even know there was the one there. Well, don't you always find Oh, 
Really? Because obviously they've had to renovate it again. It's a bit like Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Yeah. Yes, ironically, we went there and in a few months after it burnt down. Um, mind you, that, that did my hits really good, didn't it? Because, uh, yeah, that, when, that made my hits for Notre Dame go through the roof. <laughs> while, while it was still intact? Yeah, while it was still intact. <laughs> Before and after, you have to go back now. I don't need an excuse to go to Paris now. Uh, we'll just get on a train and go. Excellent. I can get him for nine quick because I'm a student. Yes! Well, you're allowed this far without paying £11.50. Oh, and there's a lot of scaffolding. Yeah. Hmm. There you go.
Squirrels. Yeah. Same as that. We've got most in Doncaster called We met some people there. They met the boat in the
Oh, well, that's more or less where we're stuck. Ah, right, okay. Yeah. That's not a problem. We can always walk back another way, can't we? I bet there's a bit of pasture. Yeah, it's. I'm going to have some in a minute. I'm going to um, take some drugs. Oh! It's almost like you just, it's, it's, it's almost like a fly swatch, just ready to... Virtual reality. Is it really? Yeah, so when this is all edited out on YouTube, anyone <laughs> who can, can just move around and it'll be like they're walking oh, around. Awesome. So it's one of the, the kind of fish, fish eye ones. Yeah. Gets, ah, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, I've got a I've got a uh, very big travel vlog. Um, so you're gonna be on the vlog. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on all sorts actually. I mean, I used to be one of the main interpreters, so they got me costumed on all sorts of stuff. Oh, I love it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's um, it, but it's it's great because I mean I I don't do it to make money. I don't for any other reason. Yeah. I do it because I love what I do. Yeah. Um, we we travel everywhere. I film everything, yeah. much to our annoyance sometimes. <laughs> but um, but it's just great to be able to look around and um, go back and need now. I've only just started doing this, yeah. but. This is brilliant because you can go back and go, oh, look, what was behind us? Oh, yeah, we'll just turn around and have a look. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, particularly with buildings like this, because there's always stuff tucked away that you maybe didn't recognise when you first went. And, and uh, I mean, with, with this building, um, say it's, I, I don't know whether you heard me saying about stuff earlier, but it's 700 years old. Yeah. Uh, in about 1320, supposedly, there's a Scots attack on the original Roman gate that was about 100 metres or so in that direction. Yeah. Um, the old story is that there were uh, kind of a couple of bits of bureaucratic issues. 
Rosalie, it was coming through uh, right by the Archbishop's Palace, the original one that was behind the Minster, and the Archbishop wasn't particularly happy with that constant flow of traffic through. The other thing is because it was going through church land, and what these are in principle, it's not a fortification uh, uh, you know, on a daily basis. What it is, is a customs point. And as a customs point, yeah, it's cash, it's murage. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. So by moving it here from church land, all of the taxation could go back into city coffers and allow for the payment of the refurbishment of the city uh, gates, the city walls, and the guards who protected these. Yeah. Um, so with this particular one, we've got one of the best preserved portcullises in the country, say, we think it's the original, 700 years old, made from uh, timbers that will be around 300 years old to be of a size. Yeah. So it will have been growing around a thousand years ago in the age of the Vikings. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Um, because it's the newest of the four main entrances, uh, we've also got this beautiful vaulted ceiling, which you can't see uh, in any of the other gatehouses. They were made with stone fronts and wings, stone yeah. bases, but the internal tower was all made from timber originally. A lot more cost effective, but that seems, yeah. seems likely that that's what caused the deterioration of the other yeah. uh, three main portcullis gates. Yeah. Uh, just here, we have um, a picture showing what the gate looked like fully closed about a hundred years ago. We have to remember that where these two uh, doorways are, it would have come out onto a second gate that would have uh, been on the front of it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, as you go downstairs as well, just um, keep your eye out because through the tunnel on the right hand side, there's another doorway like this one. And that's where the old guard hook would have been attached to the side. So they would have come out, you know, I'll see better, it'll get, it'll get a bit of a... Well, good afternoon. Welcome aboard the River Palace for this 45 minute sailing. As we leave the second landing, I need to repeat the safety announcement for the benefit of those that have just joined us. Now, the River Palace has more than enough life-saving equipment for all 55 of us on board, which takes the form of the open reversible inflatable life rafts at the front and rear of the top deck. And in the back, you'll see there's a stack of orange rigid point apparatus and life rings. These are all designed to be launched manually, but they'll also float free if required. Downstairs in the saloon, we have firefighting equipment in the form of fire extinguishers at the front and back of the saloon and a small extinguisher in the wheelhouse with me. There's also a first aid kit downstairs behind the bar for minor injuries, which we try to avoid using. So do be careful as you move around the vessel, especially near these stairs and exits. And should you find yourself downstairs in the saloon, you'll note that in addition to the exits at the front and rear, there are large windows throughout the saloon. They can be opened to form additional exits in the event of an emergency. And of course, in the very unlikely event of an emergency, please remain calm. Listen to instructions given to you by myself or the crew, and if asked to evacuate the vessel, please do so in a calm, orderly manner by your nearest and safest exit. I'll also let you know it is a non-smoking cruise, so whether you smoke or vape, please don't for the next 45 minutes. So a few introductions. Downstairs today, doing all the hard work, tying the ropes, selling the tickets, and serving at the shop and bar, I'm very ably assisted by Rafi. Well, my name's Chris, I'll be driving the boat today. I'll do my best to keep it on the wet bits and avoid the bridges. And I'll also be pointing out some of the sights and stories along the river. I'll also be throwing a few terrible jokes into the mix for good measure. Well, now we've got out of the way, I'll begin the commentary with this bridge ahead of us, which is Scarborough Rail Bridge, originally built in 1845 as part of the East Coast Main Line. At the time, it went to the holiday destinations of Whitby, Bridlington, Filey, and of course, the sunny seaside town of Scarborough. But it is a bit of an unusual bridge in the sense that it is a foot and rail bridge. You can see the footpath runs along this side. Although I have to say, if you are walking across the footpath as a train rattles across the tracks, it can be quite a daunting experience with the wheels only a few feet from the top of your head. But it is an improvement on the original design because when the bridge was first built, they had that footpath between the two lines of rail. 
Now it would seem even the Victorian Health and Safety Authorities thought this may become a bit of an issue, so they eventually redesigned the bridge, lowering the footpath by about four feet and placing it on the outside. The bridge was originally designed and built by Robert Stevenson, the son of George Stevenson. He was the man behind the Stevenson's rocket, as well as the first ever passenger carrying train in the world. Obviously quite the pedigree to live up to. Uh, it probably explains why his son decided to go into building bridges rather than trains themselves. So once we get under Scarborough Bridge, we'll keep on the theme of the railway. Once we get to the other side, if you look over the trees to our left, you'll see a white roof, the roof of the National Railway Museum. It's the largest museum of its kind in the world. It was first opened in York on the 27th of September, 1975, a date specifically chosen as it marks the 150th anniversary of the opening of the Darlington to Stockton line, a date considered by many to be the beginning of the railway age. But being that it is such a large museum, it has a variety of exhibits, around 1,200 at any one time. And if you were to visit today, you'd be able to see the only Shinkansen bullet train outside of Japan, as well as Sir Nigel Gresley's world-famous Mallard, the fastest steam train ever recorded, and in my opinion, the fastest thing ever to be named after a duck. Although in recent years, we have had visits to the museum from some other famous engines, which include Thomas, the world-famous tank engine, and a flying visit, if you can pardon the pun, from the Flying Scotsman. I did tell you the jokes were terrible. Now we've also had a visit to this museum from the magical Hogwarts Express. And that could be because the sign for platform nine and three quarters from the Harry Potter movies is situated in that museum. Now that sign was originally at York train station between platforms four and five, where those scenes for the film were originally shot. But as you'd expect, they did have a few instances with Harry Potter fans running into the wall, trying to make it to the Wizarding World charge whatsoever. And you can easily spend four or five hours walking around looking at the many exhibits. So it is a lovely way to spend an afternoon here in York. But for the next site, we're going to look ahead on our right, where you'll see that grassy bank. Once we get around that grassy bank, if you stay over the fields over on our right, you will eventually see a dark church spire, in front of which you'll spot a red brick building, the main building of St. Peter's School. Now, it claims to be the oldest school in the country, if not the entire world, originally being founded in the year 627 AD, although at the time on another site, slightly closer to the cluster of the Minster. And St. Peter's is a public school, which in many ways makes it private, as it's only public to those that can afford it. If you are to stay there, the fees for boarders have climbed to a quite significant £30,000 per year. And that doesn't even include pocket money. But if you are lucky enough to attend the school, and luckier still to become one of the head boys or head girls, there are a few benefits you'd receive. You're able to graze a goat or a sheep on the playing fields over on the right. And should you wish to do so, you can even smoke a pipe or grow a beard. Though, I doubt many of the head girls have done the latter. Well, being such an old school, there are a few famous people that attend over its years. One of notes being John Barry. Mr. Barry was a famous composer, perhaps most famous for composing the iconic James Bond theme tune. But he actually wrote music for 11 James Bond films in total, as well as movies such as Out of Africa and Dances with Wolves. Now the most famous student came some time before Mr. Barry, but you may wish to refer to him as infamous more than famous. At one point in his life this man was known as John Johnson, and towards the end of his life he was known by a few at least as Guido Johnson. It was said that when he attended St. Peter's he showed aptitude in subjects such as chemistry, politics and religious education. It was also said that he was the only man to have rented the Houses of Parliament with honest intentions, which of course turned out to be a grave error on his part. Because of that, he was executed, drawn and quartered, and his remains carried to the four corners of the empire before being placed on spikes as a warning to anyone else that may consider following suit. Although I think you'll agree, taking the current state of politics, <coughs> no one ever did. <coughs> well, some of you may have already guessed, but I am, of course, talking about Guy Fawkes, one of the men behind the infamous gunpowder pot of 1604. Fawkes was a York man, born and bred, and attended <coughs> St. Peter's when it was on the previous site. Actually, the land that St. Peter's now stands on, which will come into view on our right in a moment, once belonged to Guy's own father. It was sold to the school by Guy himself just after his father's death. Now, St. Peter's, like many schools in the country, do hold a bonfire to celebrate the fouling of the gunpowder pot on the 5th of November, with all the trimmings as you would expect. They, of course, have fireworks, sparklers, and toffee apples, 
But one thing they'll never do is burn an effigy or a model of Guy Fawkes on top of the bonfire. The reason being, in the words of the current headmaster, it would be in the utmost of bad taste to burn one of the school's old boys. I'm sure some of the current students take heart in knowing what they can get away with in later life. Well, as we now pass St. Peter's over on our right and travel upstream, it is a good time for me to talk about the river we're travelling on. This is the River Ouse, spelt O-U-S-E, but it's known as the Yorkshire Ouse as it's one of five rivers in the country to take the name. The word ooze originates from a Saxon word, ousa, which simply translates as clear, flowing water. Although I think you'll agree with me, looking at the river today, it is in fact water and flowing, though I'm not entirely sure where the word clear came from. Well, despite the discoloration, it's actually quite a clean river. The discoloration comes from peat sediment washed down from the hills and dales, and it contains a chemical known as tanning. It tans the water this colour in the same way a tea bag tans a cup of tea. Now, if you have enjoyed a tea, coffee, or even a glass of water in the city today, you'd be interested to know that to this day the water still comes from the ooze. Although unlike in the Victorian era, it was pumped around the city and hauled out logs without any treatment whatsoever, or well, nowadays you'd hope it undergoes some sort of cleaning process before reaching your taps. <coughs> Although it has been said about the river here that if you would take a pint glass full of ooze water and leave it out on the bank for about an hour or so, then it'd eventually run clear as that sediment would settle to the bottom. Well, at that time, some people would say you can drink the crystal clear water. Well, actually, you could. Of course, you would probably die, but uh, you could drink it. Now, if I were to continue indefinitely in this direction without ever turning, in about 27 miles, I'd reach the historic cathedral city of Ripon, which used to be the northernmost point of the inland navigation. Although you could travel from Ripon all the way down to London, should you wish to do so, without ever going out to sea. But you'd probably need a slightly smaller, nippier boat than this one, as well as somebody to work the 90 or so locks along the way. But with those few things, you could make it to London. Although I am told a good time from here to London is around, and then we'll head back towards the city. Before I do though, it's worth noting that boats do not have indicators in the same way the cars do. We use sound signals to show our intentions. So if you hear one short blast on the horn, that'll indicate I'm moving to the right, or to starboard in naval terms. And of course two short being a stern propulsion, which essentially means I'm slowing down or stopping. So I will warn you, the one you should listen out for is one prolonged blast that doesn't stop. That simply means I've fallen asleep with my head on the button. <laughs> In which case, somebody should probably wake me up. Otherwise, you never know where we might end up. Of course, that hasn't happened yet. But I'm told there's a first time for everything. So, do keep an army, folks. Well, here's where I'm going to make my first turn. So, wish me luck, ladies and gentlemen. I've never turned the boat here before. I'll be honest with you, I've never actually driven a boat before. So, uh, this could be interesting. But then again, it looks easy enough. How hard can it be, right? Well, let's find out together. Here we go, death defying manoeuvre number one coming up. Brace yourselves folks, I certainly will be. I was impressed with that turn. <coughs> you not clearly weren't. Ah, thank you very much. Probably just more relief than actual impressed, but never mind. Well, now that we have made the uh, turn, if you look ahead of us on our left, you'll begin to get your first views of the spires of the Metropolitical Cathedral Church of St. Peter the Apostle in York, which is a very grand name for a very grand building. 
but it's also a bit of a mouthful and that's why most locals just refer to it as York Minster. Although I've actually heard it called on more than one occasion now, that there big church. So I suppose any name is equally appropriate. Now what we can see from here is the west end of the nave. You have the two western bell towers in the forefront and the grand central tower just behind. The Minster stands at the height of 235.6 feet above the city, which makes it the tallest point in York. That's due to a local bylaw that states nothing shall ever be built taller than the spires of York Minster. So we don't expect to see any skyscrapers in the city anytime soon. But if you are feeling up for a challenge, you can climb to the very top of the Minster. Now I will warn you, it is quite a challenge. Up 276 steep and winding steps, and getting fit on the way is not an option. I know this because over the last 10 years, six people have had to be airlifted from the top of the Minster, obviously undertaking that challenge without full consideration. So it's worth a third before you attempt it. But if you manage to make it to the very top, you'll be rewarded with the best views in the city. And on a very clear day, such as today, you can see for nearly 25 miles in every direction across the entire Vale of York. So it is well worth the effort. Now the minister we have here today is actually the first to stand on the spot of the one being destroyed or replaced in the many sieges and occupations of the city. The construction of this one began in 1227 AD, but it wasn't finally declared complete until 1472. It took skilled craftsmen nearly 250 years to build. Sounds like the same people that are building my extension. Although despite that length of time, it is still an impressive feat, especially when you consider it's the largest Gothic cathedral in Northern Europe, in size of total volume anyway, and it also houses the large collection of medieval stained glass in the country, with around two-thirds of all the remaining medieval stained glass now being in the Minster. But that is spread over 128 medieval stained glass windows, the largest of which is the Grand East window, which measures more than the Centre Court at Wimbledon. Although the onset of World War II, someone had the quite unenviable task of removing each and every piece of that medieval stained glass before cataloguing it and then storing it away for the war. Despite working around the clock, it still took the team nearly six months to complete the job. And then, of course, at the end of the war, they had to put it all back in again. A two million piece medieval stained glass jigsaw. Although by then it seems they knew what they were doing, because to replace the glass only took around two months. Now the Minster is our main attraction here in the city, as a result there's a small charge for entering or going to the top, but it is well worth it. An hour or two at the very most, and it's a lovely way to see Europe from a slightly different perspective. Often go down streets or see areas you may not have otherwise known of. So if you do have a free afternoon here in York, well, there's a lovely and cost-effective way to spend it. Unfortunately, the best views of the Minster now disappear again behind the trees, so I'll go back to talking about the river. Now, you may be aware York is prone to flooding. Well, at least a couple of times each year, the river breaches the banks and floods the city, so we have a variety of flood defences, some of which will be coming back into view over on our left in a moment. That grassy bank that I pointed out before. Well, as we follow that around the corner, you'll see it eventually meets up with a red brick wall with black gates laid into it at the top of the gardens ahead on our left. Well, these were flood defences laid down in the 1980s as a reaction to the higher floods of the time. Both those banks and the wall were built to a height of 18 feet above the normal river levels, and that was just about the right height, especially during the record-breaking floods of the year 2000, when the water climbed to 17 foot and 10 inches, just two inches from oozing over the top of those walls. At the time, the government believed the walls would be breached. They had shown up helicopters flying sandbags into the city to place on top of the walls in order to protect the buildings. Now, it doesn't just protect the buildings on our left. There's around 700 homes behind, as well as shops, schools, and York Hospital. So at a flood height around 13 feet above normal, the council come around day or night, rain or shine, to close off the black gates at the top of those gardens. And then as the water subsides, they'll come back around and open them up again. Now we do hope these walls will continue to protect the buildings in the future. I mean, we are told by the Environment Agency that a flood height in York of 17 feet or more is once in just a 1,000 year occurrence, which probably goes some way to explain why it's only happened three times to see what happens next. So we're going to head back through Scarborough Bridge on our way back towards the medieval city now. But before we do, if you look through the left-hand arch of the bridge, you'll see a ruined stone tower. Well, it's not part of the city walls, that's actually Marygate Tower. It was much taller when it was first built. It was originally erected in 1266, but during the Civil War of 1644, Oliver Cromwell and his roundhead forces seized the city and destroyed many of the medieval buildings. 
Well, Marygate Tower was reduced to around half its size by the cannons of the Roundheads. But before that time, it marked the western defences of St. Mary's Abbey, a very powerful 13th century Benedictine Abbey that once stood within museum gardens. Unfortunately, nowadays, much like that tower, only the ruins of the Abbey remain. The Abbey itself was a product of the dissolution of the monasteries under King Henry VIII's rule, which some of you may have learned about in school, as this was an attempt by King Henry VIII to upgrade his first wife. <coughs> now one building that does still remain from that time will be visible just above the tower in a moment. You'll see it through the trees, a white and black wooden building with a red roof. And that was the Hospitium for the Abbey. The Hospitium was much like a guest house. It's where pilgrims or travellers who visited the Abbey could stay and rest overnight before they continued their journey. It's where we get the modern word hospitality from. The Hospitium survived the dissolution of the monasteries by being sold off by one of their monks as a private dwelling. It nowadays acts as an annex to the Yorkshire Museum, as well as being a very nice wedding venue. And the other building to remain within museum gardens is the Tempest Anderson Hall. It is better known today as the Yorkshire Museum. And as that name suggests, it does have a variety of exhibits from both York and the surrounding area, but it also houses natural exhibits. And in fact, last year, Sir David Attenborough was there to open up their new dinosaur exhibit. Now, of the many museums in the city, this one's my favourite. But if you don't fancy walking around the museum, you can spend a lovely afternoon in museum gardens. That's an area of gardens, parklands and woodlands. And of course, it is free to enter. So you can sit on the grass and enjoy picnics with the family, or get yourself a lovely ice cream and walk around looking at the nature in the sunshine. Just up ahead on the left, there's a gap in the trees through which you'll get a view of the gardens. And if you look to the very top there, as we pass, you'll also get a lovely view of the Yorkshire Museum. Just to the left of which you may catch a quick glimpse of the ruins of St. Mary's Abbey. As I say, that will be coming to view over on our left hand side in just a moment. <coughs> well, there it is, just coming to view over on our left now. So directly ahead of us now is the first of two cast iron road bridges we'll pass under, this one being Rendell Bridge, designed and built by Sir Thomas Page, who originally was studying to be a sailor until somebody suggested he try his hand at engineering, and he found his calling, because Mr Page was the man responsible for the design and build of Westminster Bridge in London, and that was before designing this bridge, as well as in the second bridge that'll pass under towards the end of the cruise. So you'll probably notice some similarities with the two cast iron road bridges here in York, and Westminster Bridge in the capital. Through the bridge on the left hand side there you can see the City Cruises boatyard, although there's been a boatyard here since 1846, but many of the surrounding buildings predate that by well over a hundred years. One building being the Guildhall at the back there, parts of which date back to the 15th century, and that makes it older than the Guildhall in London. But much of what we see today is post-war restoration, because during the Second World War York was attacked by the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. They dropped around 100 incendiary bombs on the city, six of which hit the Guild Hall, destroying the roof entirely, as well as much of the inside. Now as we go past, if you look where the two little red boats are moored up towards the back of our moorings, just above it, the ground floor windows, you'll notice some smoke damage around those windows from the fires that raged. And as we slowly sail past, if you look at the very bottom of that smoke damage, you'll notice it's been washed away in a straight line. Washed away by the river. During those record-breaking floods of the year 2000, the water sat there for a little over a week, and due to reaction with the Yorkstone, it washed away part of history. Although, it is a good indication of just how high the river can come in the city centre. So we're going to head into our right-hand side now, where you'll see the Parking Hotel. Well, that's York's second tallest building. Second only to the Minster, but not quite as grand. It was opened in the 1960s and originally named the Viking Hotel. That's because Viking artifacts were found when digging up the bank. That wasn't a huge surprise, because that bridge ahead of us was roughly the site of the original Morris River crossing, the Dublin Stones. And that was part of the Vikings' trade route through Scandinavia and the United Kingdom on the way out to Ireland. Although an interesting fact about this building is when it first opened, it actually won an architectural award for its good looks. One of York's many mysteries. So I assume it must be a magnificent hotel. Inside, anyway. 
So ahead of us now we have the Hughes Bridge. Named the Hughes Bridge because for nearly a millennium, for nearly 1,000 years, it was the only crossing over the river. Hence the name the Hughes Bridge. Although the bridge that stands there today is the fifth to stand on the spot, and the first one was put there in the 9th century. But since then we've had a variety of bridges in all shapes and sizes, the grandest of which was the one that came before this. That stood nearly twice as tall as this bridge, and although only about half as wide, on that bridge stood shops as well as houses, a chapel and a prison. Although perhaps its biggest claim to fame was also the site of England's first ever public toilet. Now, as you can imagine, that was a hole cut into the bridge with a wooden shack built around it, so I very much doubt you'd want to come on boat trips back in those days. Although when they built this version of the bridge in order to knock out this city, more the entire county of Yorkshire in half by knocking down the only river crossing at the time, they built it alongside the previous structure, building half it alongside that old bridge before they knocked that one down and built the other half of this. As we go underneath, if you look up or to the sides, you'll notice the seam where the two parts of the bridge were put together. And once we come out the other side of this bridge, if you look over to our left, you'll see the King's Arms pub. It is known locally as the pub that floods. It's one of the first buildings in the city to be affected by the rising water. Of course, the landlord, being a good Yorkshireman, doesn't like to lose his product to the river. So instead of the traditional beer cellar, he converted the bedroom upstairs into a beer attic. And that meant he was more than happy to keep the pub open during the floods, as he would have happily served a pint for standing there in a foot of water. In fact, on a few occasions, as that bar was overtaken by the river, he would just open the doors and windows and hold canoe parties in the main saloon. And believe it or not, that's actually quite true. So we're passing through the old port district of York now. We have Queen State on our right hand side and King State where some rejoined us on our left. State's another old Saxon word, it simply means mooring or landing place. Our York is very busy port district is actually the second largest inland port in the country, second only to London. And on very busy days you'd have had boats three, four or even five abreast at either side of the river here. It was said on those sort of days you could make it from one side of the river to the other without ever getting your feet wet. It'd just be a case of jumping across the top of the boats as they passed closely by. So ahead of us now we have the last bridge we'll pass under in this direction, also being the second of the two cast iron road bridges. This one is named Skeldergate Bridge, and probably the most unique of the bridges here in York. As we get a little bit closer, if you look at the arches on the left hand side of the bridge, you'll notice a seam through the middle. Now that's not a structural fault, that side of the bridge was designed to open up to allow taller masted sailing vessels into the city. Those archways would open up like gates and the top lift off to the left, like a drawbridge. Now the last time it opened was in 1971 to allow two Royal Navy inshore minesweepers into the city as part of York's 1900th anniversary. And that meant that the founding of York, or at least Eva Arkham, the original Roman settlement, was in the year 71 AD. Unfortunately, due to the floods, the winding gear was being damaged and has now been removed. That means the bridge is unlikely to ever open up again. The Scullergate Bridge, much like Lendl and Westminster Bridge before it, was also designed by Thomas Page, although it was the last bridge he ever designed, as he passed away before its completion. Luckily, his son, George Page, took up the mantle and completed his father's last bridge, and I think you'll agree, he's done a very nice job. But he did run significantly over budget, so at the time of opening, they needed a toll office to pay for the remainder. It was housed at the top of that tower over on our left, and for a while, this took on the name of Hapney Bridge. That's how much it would cost to cross here at the time. Just one Hapney. Well, again, as we pass under this bridge, if you draw your attention to the left, you're going to see a car park. Well, there's good reason for me to point it out, because that car park is built on land known as St. George's Field, and was first called St. George's Field in the 12th century, when a chapel was erected on that spot to St. George, the great British dragon slayer, by the Knights Templar. Well, of course, the Knights Templar were eventually outlawed by papal decree, and that chapel was knocked down. But the area of land over there on the left was given to the city as common ground, and as such, there are still a few rights and privileges observed on the spot to this very day. Well, one of which is the right to hold a travelling fair. It's actually been held there since the medieval period, and to this day, every Easter, we still hold a travelling fair on the car park on our left. Well, the men and women of Europe were able to come out here and hang their washing between these trees, as two of the farmers of Europe were able to graze their cattle on the land. Although, I doubt they'll get very fat on the tarmac nowadays. But perhaps the most interesting bylaw that still exists is that the young men of York over the age of 14 are still legally required. Now, there is good reason for them to practice their archery, because any young man of York over the age of 14 
should he spot a Scotsman in the city, he's still legally allowed to shoot him dead with a bow and arrow. Now the Scotsman must be growing a beard and wearing a kilt, and the shot must come from the city walls. But if the young archer's aim is true, and he was to pierce the heart of the barbarian Northman felling him, he would of course be rewarded with one shiny shilling. But I should add at this point that I very much doubt these bylaws hold up in court nowadays, and the shilling is roughly five pence in Monday money. But that's not even enough to cover the cost of the arrows, let alone the court fees, so it's probably not worth the shot after all. Well, let's agree it's not financially worth it anyway. Now, here's a joke about his gentleman, believe it or not, so please don't write in, I do like my job. But I have to add that, because I recently got a particularly nasty TripAdvisor review where a Scotsman took offence to that joke. So I will tell you, my dad is actually Scottish. He was born and raised in Bannockburn. So if I am talking about shooting a Scotsman with an arrow, well, I do, of course, mean him. Now, during those medieval fairs of old, a ducking stool would have been erected over here on our left. A ducking stool was a medieval form of punishment and originally used to test for witchcraft. Any suspected witch would be tied hand and foot to the stool and then dumped under the water for three or four minutes. It was a very simple test. If when they pulled the poor girl out she was dead, well that was obvious. That of course meant she was innocent. She'd be given a very sincere, <laughs> though rather awkward apology by the city, who would also pay for a good Christian burial. Although on the other hand, if by some miracle when they pulled the poor girl out she was still alive, well that was equally obvious. That of course meant she must be a witch having used the powers of darkness to sustain herself under the water. And in that case, she'll be dried off for a while and then executed that very evening. So she either ended up dead or, well, I guess she ended up dead. Now you could get a shorter ride on the docking stool for a series of lesser offences, but I'm going to wait till I spun the boat around for a second time before I let you know what they were. Now, if we did continue in this direction without ever turning, in about another four miles we'd reach the Loch Amir and Neyburn. Of course, after Neyburn, the river becomes tidal once again. And from there, through the many twists and turns, about 85 miles later, you'd reach the North Sea at Spurn Head. Even though the distance from here to Spurn Head in a straight line is only about 50 miles, which gives you an idea of how much the river meanders on its way out to sea. Unfortunately, I've only got about five minutes to get back to the landing, and I think Raffi wants to go home at some point today. So to avoid a mutiny, I'll finish this turn and then we'll head back towards the city. Now that we've completed that turn, as I mentioned just before turning there, you could get a shorter and hopefully less fatal ride on the ducking stool for a series of lesser offences. Now these could include for being a brewer and brewing a bad beer, or even a baker baking a bad batch of bread. Likewise, if you were a barmaid and you were caught serving short measures, then you'd probably end up with a ride on the ducking stool. But there is another reason, and a perhaps slightly more serious one, but once again this does have the tendency to offend people for some reason. Well, I do have it on very good authority that you could actually get a ride on that ducking stool for being a nagging wife. Well, I dare say there's one or two people in this city, perhaps even on this cruise, that think it's a shame these bylaws died out. As people always say to me, it's a shame to lose our old traditions. Although, in this instance, I have a tendency to agree. I mean, after all, nobody likes a short measure or a dodgy sandwich. Of course, that joke can go either way, so I'll best move swiftly on. Well, ahead of us once again, we have Skeldergate Bridge, which marks entrance back into the medieval city. There's Skeldergate at this end and Lendl at the other side, which both mark entrance or exit because they both run in line with the city walls. Skeldergate Bridge takes its name from the street that runs ahead on the left, which is, of course, Skeldergate. And that comes from the old Saxon word Skeldergarda, which simply translates as Street of the Shield Makers. Now, there aren't any shield makers on Skeldergate anymore, if there ever were, but there are a couple of shields on this bridge ahead of us. The shield on the left-hand side of the bridge, the one with the white background, the Red Cross of St. George and the Five Golden Lions, should be a familiar shield to those who live in the city. It is, of course, the coat of arms for the city of York. On the right-hand side, though, a perhaps less familiar shield, but you will find it around the city in a few places. This one has a red background, those cross keys of St. Peter, and is topped by the Archbishop's crown. Well, that shield essentially symbolises the area of land overlooked by York Minster.